wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show. Dot com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here. There is a wonderful author that we have on the show today. It's a really amazing. Every time you tune into the show, there's wonderful, brilliant authors on it. We have another one today. So we'll be talking to him to watch the video version of it and all the wonderful authors we've had on the show. Go to youtube.com for just Chris Voss. Hit the bell notification button. Also go to goodreads.com for just Chris Voss. Also go to what is it? Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram. There's multiple accounts and groups over there. You can follow on the Chris Foss show and myself and all that good stuff. Today, we'll be talking with Tim Jackson. He is the renowned author of the newest book that's out, Post Growth Life after capitalism, which is pretty cool. And so we have him on the show. We're going to be talking today about what his book is about and what it means to us in our lives and making it better. Tim Jackson is an ecological economist and writer. Since 2016, he has been a director of the Center for Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity at the University of Surrey in the UK, where he's a professor of sustainable development. From 2004 to 2011, he was economics commissioner for the UK Sustainable Development Commission, where his work accumulated in the publication of Prosperity Without Growth, which has subsequently been translated into 17 foreign languages. And what do you know? Here he is to join us on the show. How are you, Tim? Welcome. I'm good, Chris. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for coming. Give us your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs. Yeah, um, timjackson.org.uk. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there and stuff about the book. That's probably easiest. At Prof Tim Jackson is my Twitter handle, and it's also my Instagram, and you'll find me on LinkedIn as well. All right. What motivated you want to write this book? It came from that work that you talked about earlier. Some years ago, I was economics commissioner, which was a, a job reporting to the UK government. And my task there was to think about the relationship between economic growth, the continual expansion of the economy, and the fact that we're living on a finite planet, which doesn't get bigger year by year, and where that comes into conflict. And so Prosperity Without Growth was the report that came out of that. It was a report to government. It was all about policies and technologies and statistics and what was interesting is that although the government itself the uk government i have to say wasn't that interested in receiving that report from its advisors uh, a lot of other people became very interested in it because it's a kind of at the end of the day it's a question that affects all of us and it's like how do we want to live on a, on a finite planet without trashing that planet but having a good quality of life and so i really i wrote post growth for all the people who were interested in that question, but weren't policy wonks, who weren't interested in graphs and statistics, who weren't economists. And I tried to write it in a way that sort of told stories and put us as a culture in context, which is where that slightly scary subtitle comes. Life after capitalism. What, did someone kill capitalism? Because it's life after capitalism. How does that work? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I once I once had a title for the book, which was Who Killed Capitalism? And that's a chapter in the book, actually. And of course, the most obvious answer is nobody. Capitalism is alive and well, thank you very much. And living in the US and the UK, probably also in China, and everything's fine and dandy. But there are things that have gone wrong inside capitalism. That's what I wanted to look at. And it was very interesting when I started writing it back in January last year, before the pandemic, before the lockdown, before the tragedy of the last year. I was in Davos at the World Economic Forum, and there were capitalists turning up almost en masse at that meeting saying, oh, no, things are wrong inside capitalism. We've got to do something. Capitalism is dead. Long live the new form of capitalism, shareholder, stakeholder, woke capitalism. Um, we can fix it. Don't worry. But the message really interestingly was that there is something wrong and that capitalism has led us down the wrong path sometimes. And it's presided over environmental degradation. It's presided over 
poor wages to the most essential workers in society. It's presided over inequality. It's presided over financial instability. And my argument actually was, it was it's even worse than that. Somehow capitalism's got more and more into its head that what we need as human beings is more and more. And so it just doesn't know where to stop. It's pushing us down this consumerist route towards a materialist society that is not ultimately very good for us. Yeah. Do we, I think, I, I really believe we live in a world of unfettered capitalism, or at least we did over the last four or five years, where just we're throwing governments away for just unfettered, I forget what the word is, but just a, a level of capitalism that, that is uncontrollable or yeah. doesn't want to be controlled, actually. Capitalism, that's a good word. That's what like you're looking that. for. Yeah. Rogue capitalism. It's just the pollute the seas, pollute the air, do whatever you want in the name of a buck, pour mercury down child, children's throats, just have all sorts of fun. Who needs an EPA? And uh, it's been a really interesting thing, but unfettered or rogue capitalism, this is something people need to really understand. It kind of surprises me because a lot of people don't understand these things. They're like, well, I really want my coal miner job. And so I need to have the government surplus coal because I really enjoy black lung. I realize these guys get paid a lot for it. But it's We've got to come up with some sort of alternative for the future, which is slowly happening. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that we tend to think that capitalism is fixed. We think it's part of our culture. It couldn't ever be otherwise. But we forget that capitalism is only 150 years old. It's not going to last forever because nothing lasts forever. And so we need to think about where it went wrong and what comes next. And those people, those workers dying in coal mines from black lung, they do not have the best life that they could possibly have. And capitalism is not that interested in giving it to them. That short-term fix of let's have the government protect these jobs, if they're not the right jobs, if they're jobs that are killing people, if they're jobs that are underpaid and dangerous, capitalism isn't serving those people. It's serving the people on Wall Street who are getting richer and richer. Yeah, we saw how many people got, how many of the billionaires just got, I think it was like 45 more billion dollars over the coronavirus thing while everyone else got poor, basically. We saw how that worked out for them and they just went off to his private islands and and this uh, yeah crazy uh, and the people the, the tragic statistics of covid were often the poorest in society the ones who weren't the gamblers the ones who were at the front line on the front line trying to protect our lives and they had the raw deal out of it yeah tell us some other features or segments that are in the book what, what does it mean prosperity is health that's the kind of thing of tackling head-on the idea that capitalism's are sold to us that more and more is better for us that the more we have the better off we are and that's a, you know that yeah that's a kind of mantra of growth if you like let's just have more that's capital and answer to everything we haven't got very healthy lives in the poorest people of society but that's okay let's just have more and more for the richest and eventually that will trickle down and the poor oh, will yeah. get better off and and we know that doesn't work we've seen that not working and i was really struck when you think about the lesson of the last year that actually the fundamental element of our prosperity is our health when that goes missing things go wrong. And, and actually, it was a very interesting point in time in many countries, at least, because many governments actually recognised that when health was at stake and life was at stake, that is actually their priority. Thomas mm -hmm. Jefferson said it 200 years ago, the first and only task of government is the protection of health and life and not its destruction. And so this idea, and it began to grow on me, that actually what characterises health rather than just growth, which is a very more and more, thank you very much. Health is about balance. It's about a good balance between having too little and having too much. And that, and that balance is a fine art. Finding that balance is a fine art. You don't get it by bursting through every frontier, expanding at every opportunity and continually tempting people with the idea of more. You get it by recognizing where health lies, where your physical health lies, where your mental health lies, where your community's health lies, and finding that balance between the, the having too little, and there's no doubt that some people do have too little, and having too much, and there's no doubt, we were just talking about it, some people do have too much, and, and actually, even happiness isn't about having more and having too much. It is about that balance somehow between deficiency and excess. So that's a key, that's a key metaphor in the book. But I just wanted to say actually another thing about the book, which is it, it tries to approach these, what could be quite dry academic intellectual things through stories. And those stories are the stories of people who, to, to some extent, were my kind of intellectual heroes. And the people who had these 
had similar ideas. So I start, for example, with uh, Robert Kennedy back in 1968, and he gave this speech at the University of Kansas in March 68. And nobody knew that three months later he was going to be dead. But that speech at the in Kansas in 1968 was an extraordinary speech because it was the launch of his presidential campaign in 1968. And it was a speech of a man who was hoping to be the leader of what was then the richest, most powerful country in the world. And he stood up in that crowd and and he said, grace is not the be all and end all. Grace is not what we were here for. Grace is not about human dignity and purpose. And we don't live in a good country until we pay attention to those things over and above material affluence. So it, it was a way, it was a way, if you like, of having my messages or the messages that I'm interested in exploring related to people that everybody knows about and that and we're talking about them ages ago. And so all the characters in my book have that kind of quality there, have that quality of being ordinary people living ordinary lives, sometimes with very tragic endings, but having extraordinary vision and learning about those people to me, I think is a kind of resource. It strengthens you. It makes you feel that a different world is possible and it, and it brings forward that vision out of the realms of in universities and think tanks and into the lives of ordinary people. Yeah. You talk in the book about consumerism. Where did consumerism go? It's interesting in a way, you know, consumerism pretends to make us happy. So that's what consumer has on, consumerism has on offer everything, actually. You can fulfill all your needs. You can be happy. You can be a high, your highest status in your community. If you buy the right things, you'll be respected and looked up to. And ultimately, it even promises us almost a sense of immortality that we can go on forever and ever getting richer and richer. And even if we don't, then our kids can so it, it's almost like a religion in a way consumerism has become and and the most extraordinary thing to me is that consumerism wouldn't work if we were all happy because if we were happy we wouldn't need to go out and buy all these other things that consumerism needs us to go out and buy so actually when you look at it and you look at it more deeply you find that consumerism trades on unhappiness it trades on dissatisfaction because it's dissatisfied consumers that we need and you think about that sort of thing that people talk about, psychologists talk about post-purchase dissonance. It's a wonderful phrase. And it's when you've gone out and you've spent a lot of money that you probably couldn't afford on something that you get home and you realize pretty soon it's a piece of junk. And it's not actually fulfilling that promise of happiness. And at first it seems accidental. Oh, that's a shame. It's a good job all my purchases aren't like that. And then you begin to realize that there is a sense in which all purchases have to be like that because ultimately if you were a satisfied consumer you wouldn't be doing your job you wouldn't be going out shopping again you wouldn't be fulfilling that function of always wanting more so consumerism promises that promises us happiness but it ultimately it couldn't work if it didn't make us continually unhappy does social media play into that? Because like you, uh, a lot of people go on like Instagram or something and they have FOMO, fear of missing out. And they see somebody that's, that's clearly a staged and framed thing. But a lot of young people, I think, I don't know, I don't know how many, but many people, many young people get fooled into believing that, oh, that guy is really driving Lamborghinis and living his best life. And all he did was, I don't know, buy a product and they're usually doing product placement. So like doves, I'm not picking on dove, but this doing an example, dove made me drive Lambos. And <laughs> is social media a problem to cons rampant consumers and going wrong? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's the new, it's the new kind of mainstream for advertising, really. Advertising always did that. That was its job, really, was to connect us emotionally to a product, to make us feel as though we could not do without. And, and almost sometimes to shame us into it, you know, what does your car say about you? What does your dog food say about you? What does the toilet roll say about you? And what are people going to think when they come into home and see this tatty toilet? You need this one, not that one. And, and that dialogue has always been the dialogue of advertising, the role of advertising to create an emotional connection between the products that people want to sell and us as raw, visceral beings who are susceptible to that. Let's face it. We have the ability to think symbolically. So we create these symbolic associations with all this stuff and they become in our minds they become fulfillments not just for wiping up but actually 
everything in our life that we aspire to, including that wonderful status of being good citizens. And so it's, I'm not knocking that mechanism because I think if you look at every society, you see that mechanism that material things play a symbolic role that allows us to have rich emotional lives and connections with each other. But in the hands of capitalism, what we've done is we've created an engine that insists that we have to translate everything into that mechanism. And social media, as you say, actually, I have to say, it's not just young kids who are led astray by advertising on social media. I don't know about you, but lockdown, Instagram, the product that they know that I want, that maybe will be delivered in, you know, three months time. And probably when I get it, isn't going to be any good, but was I ever a sucker for it? Yeah, of course. I was. Yeah. I had all powerful. pretty pictures and pretty videos and my favorite ads, they creep me out because I think they go too far and they really play on women's, women's emotions, but they're the ones that the, I saw like an ad, I think it was from Walmart the other day. I pick on Walmart since they're not an advertiser. And it was like, so it, I, the, either the tagline, I think the tagline was something about the best mom or the greatest mom shops at Walmart. And you're just like, what? So you're a horrible mom if you don't? And this gal was going on, her daughter runs up, mom, you're the best mom ever. Or something along those lines. Mm. And the mom's like, oh yeah, great. I ordered these things from Walmart, honey. And you're mm. just like, you're just like, wow, man, that kind of seems to have gone over a couple lines. Yeah, uh, of shaming. And the way that's very clever, the way that advertisers have done, you could respect in some sense of how oh, yeah. clever they are, yeah. because the way they've used kids in order to do that, it's not just you need to be the best mom for your kids, but you need your kids to have a decent status in society. So you play off the kids, you play off the parents, you play off the relationship between kids and parents. You do what it takes when you're advertising to create that emotional link. And, and it can be yeah, as you say, brutal, unfair, obscene. Almost obscene. I've seen the same thing in diapers. I think there's a diaper advertiser that says the same thing. Good moms choose so-and-so diapers. And you're like, so people don't buy that or horrible moms? Is that yeah. that is that what you just implied there? They're bad people. Yeah, this is, yeah it's like a kind of a moral calculus, isn't it? Yeah, that it is. What you buy, you add it all up, and that tells you how good you are in society, if you were to believe these things. I mean, of course... Yeah. And it the weird thing is we, mm -hmm. we, we don't, at some level, we don't, we know we're being manipulated, but actually the manipulation is so powerful, so unregulated, and we expose our kids to it, we, we expose ourselves to it, we expose everybody in society to it, and it's, it becomes almost impossible to free yourself from it unless you ban, you know, you ban your kids from the t TV or, or, or take their phones away or stop them going on social media, which becomes very difficult, obviously. And it is, and I think the important to recognize that it's a, a societal problem, that it's a condition of our culture that every individual, including the two on this call, are susceptible to. Wait, I'm susceptible to it too. No, it's, it's really out of control. And I think when they do products and stuff on Instagram and and or or Facebook or any of these other sites, you see the likes, and people are like, "Oh yeah, I want to be successful too. I want to use Dove soap to have drive Lambos." I'm just using like, extreme things, but and just everyone's living their best life. I think it was a joke a comedian did years ago. I forget who it was. My apologies to whoever, but they said that when archaeologists from the future, I don't know, they might be human or they might be aliens, they'll be digging up our society, going, "What, what are these guys doing?" And uh, they're going to like look at all of our stuff and be like, wow, they all had some disease that made them smile all the time. They're all smiling in their mm -hmm. Instagram. This is a weird culture they had. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I have this fantasy about digital archaeology that actually, in the, because almost everything is becoming digital. So everything that we remember and record and our culture is going to be laid down on this digital technology. And of course, it's going to be thrown away. It's going to be degraded. And I have this idea that in the future, a really important job is going to be the digital archaeologist who runs around digging this stuff up. And he's got all this access to kit from over the last 150 years that he uses to piece together a picture of what society was like under late capitalism in the early 20th century. And as you say, what kind of sense will we make of it? And in a way, that's a good, it's an interesting way to think what's left when that goes down. What is it about us that is really human? What are the things that would, could make it for a better life? And, and that's part of the, 
task of the book, I guess. Yeah. So how do we resolve this? What are some things that you give us in the book so that we can resolve these issues or try and come to a better resolution? One of the things, and it really struck me, and I had, I have, I had young kids that are, that are growing up now. I used to take them, I used to take them on holiday. I used to take them into nature, and and because I was preoccupied with keeping them happy and giving them what they want. We would go past an advertising hoarding, for example, for an animal park, it was called. And you'd go into this animal park and you'd be led round in corridors with thousands of other parents looking after thousands of other grumpy kids, looking through the fences at these animals that you couldn't properly see. And at the end, you come into the you know, the merchandise area where you've got all this fluffy stuff and you cannot stop six-year-old kids wanting fluffy toys. It's just impossible. So you come out of that, you spent a fortune, your kids are grumpy. You're thinking, what the, what am I doing here? And then the next day, and it's, we need to get out of this. I just took them into the hills behind the house where we were staying. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to really entertain them here. I'm going to have to really find something to do and interest them. And I didn't at all. They interested themselves. They played for hours by streams, building dams or collecting wood or role-playing or playing chase or running around. And, and that to me, it was a long time ago now, but it became a sort of critical insight to me that there are things that we are happier doing than traipsing around after consumerism and after stuff. And I believe, I believe that we've lost that understanding. We've lost it out of our schools. We've lost it out of our education systems. We've lost it out of our communities. We don't build our lives that way. And, and I think it's something we can recover. And one of the, the ideas in the book is this concept of flow, of being really involved in something that you're doing and almost losing track of time, losing track of yourself, losing track of the boundaries between you and the world and the task. It all becomes one somehow. Psychologically, it's been shown that this is one of the most satisfying, what's most fulfilling states that human beings can experience. And yet it's undermined by materialism. It's undermined by having too much stuff. It's undermined, interestingly, by having too much comfort. In some sense, there's a place that is better than the place that consumerism offers. But we have to come out of our comfort zone. We have to learn different skills. We have to teach our kids how to find this place. And actually, it offers us, after capitalism, a better kind of life. And, and it's available. It's a message that you can take into your individual life, finding that place and understanding where it is and developing your skills and taking on challenges. But it's also a lesson for society because we have to create the conditions under which that's possible for people. It's funny. You, you bring up a good point. I've seen the same sort of setups, like you say, for parents that have kids and they just, just they just put it right in your pathway and you're just like, ah, oh, I just, <laughs> I've seen it many times that I'm like some poor some poor guy with kids is getting suckered by the setup there and the kids i was the same way when i was we'd walk through the store and drive my poor mom crazy i'd be like we'd be like mommy 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 what that cereal what that cereal what that what this what this can we have this in fact i think one of her deals was if we were good in the store and and didn't make too much of a problem we got like a candy bar or something that was her way of yeah right giving us but we drive her crazy with the can we have this can we have that and i remember my yeah. brother he would throw he always wanted a special cereal if I recall rightly, he'd throw a fit if he couldn't get that cereal. And it was expensive, and, and I don't think it was good for him either. <laughs> so my mom was like, no, get that. And you yeah. know, he'd throw a fit there in the, he was an ADD. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's interesting. But in a way, that's a really good, that's, a, that's such a good story because it's, it's a sort of, it's a metaphor for what we are. We're all kids in the candy shop. That's, and that's what capitalism kind of preys on in a way. If, if we're kids in the capital, in the cap, in the candy shop, we're told more and more is the way to go. There are no restraints on us. And it's very difficult to see how you can ask people to self-regulate in those conditions. That it's, I, I actually won't, I have to say I'm a sugar junkie and I won't have biscuits, cookies oh. in the house. I cannot have them in the house because I know if they're in the house, I'm, I'm just going to eat them. <laughs> you and know, I, think, I, you know, I started dieting years ago and lost 75 pounds. And one of the most important things I learned, I think it was from Penn and Teller's book or it was from somebody on Facebook, but the important rule for dieting, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. So don't exactly. bring it home. Don't buy it. Exactly. Don't bring it home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't go shopping when you're hungry. There's, but in a sense, we're all having to do that to try and regulate. And we've got all this now. We've got these telephones with apps on which tell us what our ideal body weight should be and what our calorie intake should be. And we're doing all these calculations. And yeah, you can do it if you really work hard at it. But in a society that doesn't want you to do it, 
eventually that's going to go off the curve. Obesity is going to rise. Illness is going to rise. Hypertension is going to rise. The medical service is going to be under pressure. And that's not the direction of more prosperity. That's the direction of less. Yeah. Some other aspects of your book that we want to take and talk about, some of the questions I had, what lessons can lockdown teach us about society? What did we learn on that? Or did we learn anything for that matter? Yeah, I think we're still learning it, Chris, and we're going to be learning it for a while. <laughs> it's coming. It's actually here. And yeah, it, we have it here yeah. too. Yeah. Do you? Do you? Yeah. And I'm going to start wearing a mask again. I've got my inoculations or whatever, my uh, shots, but evidently this thing can be, I just don't want that thing in my body. I don't care that I have the shots, mm. but it's scary. It's 40% more contagious. So you're right. We might go into another lockdown. So I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, I think it, it was a very humbling sort of thing for humanity. Really, was- You thought you were invincible. Hey, hang on. There's this little thing. You can't even see it. You don't even know how it works. The doctors don't even know how it works and it can bring you down. That's a very humbling thing to find out, but it also taught us. It did teach us that lesson in about health actually being more important than wealth when it comes to it. It taught us that lesson about actually what the role of government is back to Thomas Jefferson. It taught us also sometimes, and I'm not saying this is true for everybody, sometimes it it taught us that the, the most important people in society, the people who saved our lives were not well looked after before we got there. Or Um, after. Or after, absolutely. We were clapping the health workers in this country. I'm sure you were as well. Uh, And then two months later in the UK, there was a call from nurses for for a pay rise. And they were given, the government agreed a pay rise that was less than the rate of inflation. So that's how much we were valuing all of those people who served our lives under capitalism. But it also taught us, I think, there were some interesting studies about about lockdown itself, where people found the skills that they hadn't had before. They found space that they couldn't didn't find before. There was something nice and more healthy about going out into an environment that wasn't stuffed full of cars all over the place. There was cleaner air. There was these stories of of actually how you could see the mountains in the Himalayas from a province in India that had never been seen for 30 years. There was this sense actually of of kind of nature beginning to recover a little bit from the impact of human activity. And there was also this sense of us not comfortable at all, really. You're staring in the lockdown mirror and you're asking yourself, who am I? Who is this person? What is my life? And it forces that kind of period, that sense of reflection And out of that reflection sometimes came, not always, but sometimes stronger relationships, skills that you'd forgotten or that you didn't know you had, new interests and the ability to, even just sometimes the ability to stop because our lives are so busy and and harried and hurried and we're continually under the consumer myth. We're continually on the move and getting things and moving. And lockdown did it gave us that just momentary, who are you really? What is it that really matters? And, and that was, it had its tragic sides and it had its really deeply uncomfortable sides. But it also, I think, is a point at which, and that's what I mean by we're still learning the lessons. We're still learning the lessons from that. We don't know where that's going to take us. But it does offer us different ways of thinking about society and about what we want in our lives. It's funny. It made me really analyze my life. What was important initially, it was really focused because I was like, what's most important to you in life? And the human beings in your life can disappear in a heartbeat. And you don't get to hold their hand when they go into the hospital. You don't get to talk to them. You don't see some, in some cases in the early days, you didn't get to go to their funeral. My sister passed away during the coronavirus. She, she didn't get it, but she'd been in, she'd been in, uh, she'd been in the uh, care homes for all of her life. And so her health wasn't good and she had seizures, but I'm sorry um, to hear that. And you couldn't go to her funeral. Was that- we were able to go to her funeral, but it was the loneliest funeral I've ever been to. It was yeah. just me and my mother and uh, someone from her church, and then the person who worked at the funeral home, like it was the four of us. It yeah. was like the most saddest. It was a sad funeral in and of itself, but it was incredibly sad because you're just like, no one could come. Like all of the, all of the nurses who cared for her wanted to come and you just couldn't have people at your thing. Yeah. I, there was a lot of stuff that I sat down and went, I went, wow, this is a, uh, this is heartbreaking. This is hard. And mm. you go, what do I value most? And for me, I was like, I value my mom and my sisters the most. And I'd really like to see them get through this and out mm. the other side. And fortunately I have that, but yeah, a mm. lot of people learned a lot about uh, who they were. I, th- I think that's really important. The, the, 
the pandemic and the period of the last year has been about tragedy and it's been about loss and it's been about suffering. And, and it seems to me that capitalism tries to always turn our eyes away from that. It tries to say, well, if you struggle, if you strive, if you compete, if you have the right stuff, if you get on, you'll get on and everything will be fine. It'll be fine forever. And of course it's nonsense because everyone dies and, and everyone experiences loss and everyone experiences suffering. And I was really struck, I was really struck by where does capitalism get that idea from that it's going to be okay forever. And it really gets it from a process of denial that if you look at the early philosophers around capitalism, you'll find they acknowledge that everything is a struggle for existence and then they look at human beings and say, ah, human beings are selfish. They're competitive. That's the best way to get the best conditions out of life is for everybody to compete. And they turn life and society into a competition where if you win in the competition, then you can be your best self. You can leave this suffering behind you and you don't have to suffer anymore. And of course, it's nonsense. And I was particularly fascinated by the fact that actually there's a sense in one of my characters that is a Vietnamese monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, and he's, he's, his religion is Buddhism. And I was fascinated by the fact that Buddhism starts in exactly the same place, that, that everything entails suffering, that we cannot escape suffering. But instead of saying, if you struggle and strive and you compete and you become your best self, you're going to escape from it. Buddhism says, actually, that's not true. You will just turn the world into a greater scene of suffering the way to address that suffering is to turn and face it to have compassion for it to have compassion for other people to build your relationships around other people to value the things that really matter and to find inside your life the way of navigating and negotiating that suffering and it's such a di it's so diametrically opposed now i'm not suggesting that we all become buddhist monks it's just not everybody's cup of tea but it's it's a really deep reflection on the fact that we chose a path that potentially leads us and other species on the planet and our descendants into greater and greater suffering instead of facing that idea that suffering is an important component of life and that we should be compassionate as a result of the compassion is our root, not out of suffering, but coming to terms with loss and coming to terms with tragedy and doing what we can to alleviate that loss and that tragedy. And it's a very different direction than consumerism is taking us. There you go. There you go. Anything more we want to touch on in the book or tease out to, for readers to pick it up? I suppose... The other thing, when I was talking about flow, there's something about that, that discussion that we've just had about compassion and suffering might feel a bit heavy. But the thing about flow actually is that it can be very joyful. So that's another thing that in a way we need to focus on and brings joy into our lives. It's one of the things that we could occasionally find through lockdown in deeper relationships or more, more calm in our lives or a deeper connection with nature. And I think that's another theme in the book is that in order to find those things, we develop the skills that allow us to become creative. And it's a, it's a really interesting way to think about economics because we think about economics as selfish people competing to produce the most and increase the GDP and everything will be all right. And there's no poetry, there's no art in it, there's no music in it, there's no love in it, really. And, and so part of what the book is trying to do is to say, what would our society look like? What would our economy look like? What would our economic system look like if we put those things back into our consideration of what the good life is. And, and it leads right back to that speech by Robert Kennedy back in the day, because all of those components were in what he was saying. And they're all in the work of Tishna Han and they're all in the work of, of an environmentalist in Kenya called Wangari Matai. And they're all in the poetry of Emily Dickinson. And, and so those people, in a way, I bring together in the book to make that very simple point that our lives after capitalism can be richer, better, yeah. more fulfilling. And where was that speech at for Bobby Kennedy? University where? of Kansas. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to pull that up. I'm a big, he's my number one hero. So he's great. And that's, there. you just get lost in it. And I went to ra down a rabbit hole the whole time, looking at the lives of some of these people and fantastic stuff that you can find on YouTube. And I watched, I watched his videos during that, that 
campaign over and over again and listen to his words, listen to the way that he spoke, listen to the way he connected with people. He would turn up at a crowd and they would take the piss out of him because he had long hair or longer hair than was fashionable. And he would just turn it around and make a joke of it. Yeah, I've got long hair, but I'm here. I've come to you. I'm speaking to you. And on the night that Martin Luther King was assassinated, he was in front of, he was in a town in Indianapolis where, where there was a largely black crowd. And he stood in front of that crowd and he sympathized with them. And the mayor actually said to him, don't go in front of that crowd. They bloody lynch you, mate. They don't, you couldn't do that. And he said to the, you might not be able to do that, but I know these people. I've worked with them. I've talked to them. I've developed things with them. I can stand in that crowd with my wife and kids and I will be safe. And he did it. And he talked to them about loss, about suffering. He even quoted poetry to them. And, and that was the quietest town in the US that night. And you, you get the stories around these lives rich because of the, because of the humanity in these people. And they are, they, to me, they're a kind of shining example of, of a different way of thinking about our society and a, and a route out of the dysfunctionality of capitalism. I love your book. I'm glad people, I'm glad there's more information going out. People need to understand I'm a capitalist. I, I believe in capitalism. I'm an entrepreneur all my life, but even owning business all my life, I can look at trickle, trickle down economics as a failure. I can see the heavy hand of billionaires that are, are owning our uh, governments and just doing whatever they want and trying to make it so that governments don't have any sort of regulation on them and just rampant, like you say, rogue capitalism. It, it's really interesting. I don't know if you've studied, I imagine you've studied much U.S. behavior and society, but it's interesting in America, there's this thing that we're willing to sell our souls and our bodies to capitalists and billionaires, and we vault them as heroes. And we think that they give a crap. Like there's, there, I have so many friends that are like, Elon Musk is the greatest. He cares about us, no one else. And you're like, he does not. He cares about you as a consumer of his goods. That's mm. a, he's a pan-globalist. He's not concerned about democracy or mm. things that are important to us. He's concerned about making money. And these guys all think that it was the same thing that we saw with uh, a president recently. We're like, oh, he's going to get office because he cares. Mm. He's a billionaire. And so he doesn't need money. So he's actually going to care about people. And you're just mm. like, are you insane? And they did a study and they found that a lot of Americans, they see a lot of this capitalism as oppressive and not good for them. They don't want the rules changed because there's this delusion. And uh, they addressed it in the movie Fight Club, where marketing for years had told us that we'd all be millionaires. And, and so they don't want the rules changed on the billionaires or millionaires right now because everybody in America thinks they're going to be one eventually yeah, yeah so they don't want the rules change when they get there yeah, yeah. you're like this is insane this mm. just makes no sense at all yet this there is, is a kind of you us. know there is a kind of set uh, yeah it's been sold to us there is a kind of sense in which we've been gaslighted and i think in a way a part of our task right now is is to lift our eyes above that and to say actually here's some other things here's some other things that human beings are about and here's some other heroes and these people have some extraordinary ideas that can that could transform our society, could make us richer in a different way. And of course, we all need we all need heroes, and we and we all want to believe that we're as good as those people, or we could be as good as those people. And if our heroes are all people who are just searching for more and more flashy and more status and more expansion and breaking through every frontier until we get to Mars or, or, or we're rich enough so that we can go up in space with our brother on a, a vanity moonshot. That's a, that's a bad place to be. And, and it seems to me we have to weave together. We have to build with whatever we've got different sense of what we're aspiring to. And, and the characters in, in the book are a part of an attempt to do that. Here's a different road. These are different people. They are as heroic as those people that are leading us astray and some of them you know care more about us than those supposed leaders ever will there you go there you go it's been wonderful to spend time with you today give us your plugs as we go out Yes, yeah, so you can find more about the book on timjackson.org.uk you can find me on uh, twitter at prof tim jackson and you can find me on instagram and linkedin and places like that as well i'm at the university of surrey my research there is asking that very simple question what can prosperity possibly mean on a finite planet there you go there you go tim it's been wonderful to have you this has been a great discussion i hope people pick up the book and read it and, and realize how bad this uh, capitalism is getting out of control and how good it could be if we yeah. dare to change it 
Yeah, there you go. Thanks, there you go. Chris. Thank you very much, Tim. So pick up the book, guys, Post-Growth, Life After Capitalism by Tim Jackson. You can find it. It's on wherever you f find books <laughs> anywhere. Find books anywhere. Go ahead and order the book up from uh, wherever you do. Support your local booksellers as well. You can go to goodreads.com for us. Chris Voss to see the books we're reading and reviewing. Go to all of our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and all those places, Instagram. And you can also go see us on youtube.com for us. Chris Voss for the show to your friends, neighbors, relatives. Thanks, Tim, for being here. Thanks, my audience, for being here. And we'll see you guys next time.